Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. We thank the Lord for the first Bible study, FCT Abuja, all together. And I pray that this will be an enriching time for every one of us in Jesus' name. I want to appreciate all of us who are here, members of the choir, thank you very much. A little talk of Jesus makes it right. And all our ushers and leaders and those who are still here, our state overseers, so they are not sitting here today, but you know, they are somewhere. They were the state overseers. Where are you? State overseers? Where? Wonderful. God bless you. Thank you very much. We still have our leaders who are with us during the Workers' Congress. And they're still here with us. They said they will not leave us until we say the final amen. And um, and newcomers who are here today, newcomers who are here, this is the first time of coming to Deeper Life Bible Study. Where are they? Where are you? Raise up your hand. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, something will come upon your life today you'll never forget. And uh, we've been studying from the Acts of the Apostles and we're still going to continue. God has a verse for everyone. A promise for everyone. And tonight's uh, Bible study is going to be a combination of study and revival. And uh, so we'll, we'll study the Word. And, uh, you know, after the Bible study, when we say, now let us pray, don't say, I'm rushing for something because Bible study is over, you'll be surprised. They'll tell you what happens after you've gone. Something good is on the way in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, what a wonderful day, beautiful day to come together to study your word. I pray, Lord, you open the pages of the scriptures to every one of us in Jesus' name. Bless everyone here. And we pray that this word will never leave us in Jesus' name. Where there is confusion, oh Lord, I pray you'll bring understanding. Where there are things in our lives and our families who wondered, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Give us solution to every problem in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, we we'll still carry on with the revival. The spirit of revival will be upon everyone. You'll break every yoke in everybody's life. And any plan of any herald against any child of God here, send supernatural help from heaven and deliver your people in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. In this Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, you'll find how the chapter begins. Look at chapter 12 verse 1. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex, to torture, to torment, to destroy, to kill certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread, the time of the Passover. And when he had apprehended him, that means when he had arrested him, that means when he had taken him, he put him in prison. And he delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in the prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. God will answer the prayer of the church. The enemy's opposition against the spread of God's saving truth, of the gospel, of the word of God, was resumed by Herod. He stretched forth his hand and he took one of the pillars of the church. 
he took one of the great men, preachers, pioneers in the church, and he killed him. After killing him, he stretched forth his hand again to the second one, that is Peter. And he wanted to destroy Peter also, but he put him in the prison because he saw that the Passover of the Jews, that Passover was coming. And because of that Passover, if he had killed Peter at that time, he will be unpopular. And you need to understand that Herod was a great politician. All he wanted was to be popular with the people. And when he killed James, he saw that pleased the children of Israel, the Jews. Why did it please the Jews? Because these were the people spreading the gospel. They were preaching Christ and people were getting saved. They were leaving the old traditional religion that does nobody any good. And they were coming to Jesus Christ, the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And he called them earlier and he said, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now they warned him, they said, lest they shall spread. Everybody must be keep quiet. Don't preach this word again. But they kept on preaching and preaching and preaching the word. That's the reason why when he took James and he killed him, that pleased the people. And that pleased Herod himself. You want to know something about one? There are things that please people that do not please God. And there are people that think if they please themselves, like Herod pleased himself, and also please the people, they think that that will be wonderful, that will be all right. Because pleasing Herod himself and pleasing the people, that might please God. But the Bible says, no, it doesn't please God. The ways of God are higher than the ways of man. And the things that please man, they do not necessarily please the Lord. Notice that in your life, if you try to please this and please this and please that, and you think you are pleasing God, you might not be pleasing God. And eventually we're told that the church began to pray after Peter was kept in the prison. And when Peter was kept in the prison, you see what happened? He wasn't panicking. He wasn't anxious. He wasn't worried. We sang, uh, you know, tonight, why worry when you can pray? Why are you anxious when you can pray? There is still a God on the throne, and that God answers prayer. And because God answers prayer, there will be no panic in your life in Jesus' name. And then we're told that he kept him. It was, that's what we call maximum security prison. The soldiers were there at the gate. The soldiers were there at the door. And the soldiers were changed unto him. And Herod was so sure he had provided maximum security in that prison and that nothing could get out Peter from there. When we read the story, you will see what happened. An angel came up from heaven. Those angels are still there. And when they need to come and deliver any of the children of God, those angels are sent and deliver. And then they smote him on the side and got him up. And all the chains fell off. Like all your chains are falling off already. And then he said, get up and put on your sandals and put on your clothes. He put on his clothes and then he came out. And when he got to the next door, the iron door, that even if you escaped from those soldiers and you escaped from those chains, when you got to this door, how are you going to open the door? Because if those soldiers wake up all of a sudden, they say, where is Peter? Where is Peter? They'll be after him. But then the door opened of its own accord. And then they go to the iron gate that leads into the city. And that gate opened. You know that all gates are open before you this year. Because the power of the Lord is there. The presence of the Lord is there. And because of that presence of the Lord, every door that Herod has raised up to imprison you, incarcerate you, confine you, all those doors, they are opened in Jesus' name. And then... Peter thought, where will he go? Now he's delivered. It was in the dead of the night. And so he said, I'll go to the house of uh, the mother of John Mark. And that was the place they were praying for him. You see, God directs and guides the steps of the children of God. He knocked at the door. When he knocked at the door, there was a maid there. Rhoda came to the door. And when she heard the voice, she was so surprised, God answers prayer. I'm here to tell you tonight, God answers prayer. 
And then she went back in to say, the Lord has answered her prayer. Peter is right there. And Peter is wondering, where is this girl? Open the door, let me come in. And then they said, no, it's not Peter. And she kept on affirming it's Peter. And so they said, thou art mad. Something has gone wrong because Peter is in the prison. You see, why were they praying if they didn't know that God will answer prayer? You know what I want to tell you? God answers your prayer even when your faith is weak. When you think, can God answer that prayer? It would be a great surprise and shocking, a shocking statement to me if God answered my prayer. But he answers the prayer of weak people. You say, I'm weak. I don't know how to pray much. Even if that answer came, I wouldn't know that that was the answer. But he answers the prayer of all his people. Eventually, because Rhoda kept on affirming, he opened the door. They were so surprised. And Peter said, hush. Don't shout because if you shout, you'll wake up the people around. And then they know that Peter is out of the prison. And then he considered he went to another place. And then look at the final, the, the uh, verse 24 there. It says, but the word of God grew and multiplied. What Herod was trying to prevent, what Herod was saying, this will not happen. And that's exactly what happened. The Lord reversed all the intention of Herod, all the plan of Herod, all the things, all the purpose of Herod. The Lord reversed everything. The word of God grew and multiplied. All the intentions of Herod, of Haman, of Satan, of the devil in your life, they are reversed in Jesus' name. We're going to study this under three perspectives. The real topic is divine intervention after disciples intercession divine intercession inter intervention after disciples intercession now number one severe persecution and plot against the pioneers severe persecution and plot against the pioneers and then point number two supernatural preservation of the preacher through prayer the supernatural preservation of the preacher through prayer he'll preserve your life he'll preserve your family he'll preserve the church of the living god in jesus name point number three sinner's punishment and the prevalence of preaching sinner's punishment and the prevalence of preaching we're coming to chapter chapter 12 of the acts of the apostles we're looking at verses 1 and 2 again now about that time what time that was the time that barnabas and uh, saul the two relief to jerusalem you read that in the last verse of um, that of the previous chapter and around that time was when persecution rose up against the church herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain in the church and he killed james the brother of john with the sword wait a minute there he killed james the brother of john with the sword sometimes when somebody you know to be a real believer that fellow dies you wonder Sometimes when you see a person fighting for the Lord, a person who is really sold out to the Lord, consecrated to the Lord, who has left everything and is serving the Lord, when that person dies, you ask yourself, but why? I know that brother. I know that sister. If anybody should die at all, it shouldn't be that brother. It shouldn't be that sister. The question is, why did God permit James to die at this time. I'm looking with you from Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. And we're looking at verses 1 and 2. It says, The righteous perisheth, and no man lays it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, and none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. God is a wise God. And God is a merciful God. He knows the future. And because he knows the future, he takes away the righteous man 
from the evil to come. If God sees that, you know, ahead of somebody, the future of this particular person is doing well right now, is saved right now, is sanctified right now, is holy right now, is ready for heaven right now. But in the future, something was going to happen that would be beyond the strength and beyond this power and beyond this control that he might go back. The Bible says he takes away the righteous from the evil to come. And so that's why we are not surprised about uh, James at all going. The Lord knew the future of that man. And he knew that it was just right for him to go at this time. Look at Acts of the Apostle chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 24. Acts 13 verse 24. When John at first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John fulfilled his cause, look at that word fulfilled, as John fulfilled his cause. Do you know that uh, John too was killed? But you see, God sent John to do a particular thing here on earth. He was a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will point Jesus Christ to the people. He's done that already. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The next day you saw him again. Behold the, the, the Lamb of God that taketh away the, the sin of the world. And then he's he talking about Christ. I'm not worthy to uh, tie a shoe. I'm not worthy to bear a shoe. They said the one that will save after he has shown him to the whole of the nation. The Lord said, you have done what I sent you to do here on earth. He fulfilled his cause. That's the reason why Herod could touch him. Nobody can touch you until you finish your race here. Until you finish your course here. If you find any believer that that believer, he was saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, all of his son find the believer is gone. Number one, God takes him away from the evil to come. Number two, he has finished his cause. And because he has finished his cause, that's why the Lord allowed him like that to go. And we're looking at uh, chapter 17 of John. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17 verse 4, it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This is about Christ our Savior. And this is about a perfect example. You see what Jesus said there? I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. Look at verse 11. Verse 11, and now... I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Why am I coming to thee? I've finished. I've finished. Because I've finished my cause, that is the reason I am coming to thee. We need to understand that. And so we'll not be wondering in our hearts, why did so and so go like that? Why did so and so die like that? Because he has finished. Because she has finished. And because she finished, or because he finished, that's why the Lord allowed him to go. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 and verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, verse 7. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul, how could you say that? Why are you going out? How is it to have seen the time of my departure is at hand? Look at verse 7, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Because I have finished, what am I doing here? The Lord sent me here for a particular reason. He sent me here to fulfill a particular ministry, and I've finished that, and because I've finished, I am ready to go. And so you understand why those things happen. Like, we're coming back to, we're coming back to Acts of the Apostles, and we're now in chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 1 again. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 1. Now, about the time, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church and he killed James the brother of John and he killed James the brother of John and there were quite a number of people there if we're thinking of the apostles there were 12 apostles and these were pillars of pioneers in the church why James in particular in Mark chapter 10 Mark chapter 10 and we're reading now from 
verse 35. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. We have a great instruction from here. And um, in the verse 35, Mark 10, verse 30, are you there? What's the first name there? And James and John, notice that. And James and John were told the sons of Zebedee, they come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what she asked. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And he said unto him, We can, we will, we must. Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I am, that I will, that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. It shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. You see here, James and John came to the Lord Jesus and allow us that one will sit here, the other one will sit on the other side in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking about. That's something great. So that's something beyond even me, Christ, to give unto you. Are you able to drink the cup? What cup is that? Do remember Gethsemane. If this cup of death will not pass me, except I drink it, that will be done. It was a cup of death. And um, James said, yes, we will. Yes, we can. And John said, yes, we can. And yes, we will. And the Lord said, yes, you will drink that cup, the cup of death. And this is it here, that the fulfillment of the promise they had made and the fulfillment of the prophecy that the Lord had given. That's the reason why the Lord allowed that. But let me tell you something. You see, you see Herod, Herod was thinking, I take away James, then I weaken the church. I take away Peter, then I weaken the church. Why? Because they were pillars. And when you take away the pillars of a building, the building is gone. But Herod did not know that you cannot fight against God and win. I said you cannot fight against God and win. He took James away. See what God does. See what God has done. I'm looking at chapter 12, verse 17. Chapter 12, verse 17 of Acts. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision that he had seen should mean, behold, the men, in verse 17, behold, the men, which, oh, that's chapter 10. That's an extra. Everybody say extra. I was wondering that uh, this is an extra verse that I'm giving, not the one that is really uh, chapter, chapter 12, verse 17, but he be beckoning unto them with the hand hold to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go and show this is unto, tell me, tell me out loud, unto James and to the brethren and he departed and went into another place. Herod, Herod thought he was clever. He killed one James and God said, Herod, look up. There's another James. I'm raising up another James. The church will not, never lack leadership. And when one workman is gone, the God of the work will raise up another. Look at this James that we find now. The one that replaced the James that had gone. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. And I'm reading here from verse 13. Acts chapter 15. We're reading from verse 13. And after they had held their peace, tell me what follows. James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. You see, Herod thought, I'm going to destroy the church. I take, I take away one James, and God said, You won't do that. You can't destroy the church. Upon this rock I build my church. 
And the gates of hell cannot prevail against that church. And so James rose up to replace the other James. And he said, Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who doeth all these things known unto God are all his works from the, from, from the beginning of the earth. I want you to look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. This James that replaced the other James, here is the book, the epistle that God made him to write. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad greetings. So you will see that uh, God will not lack workers and um, uh, Herod could not overturn, upturn the work of the Lord. He killed that other James, but another James is here already. We're looking in at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 2. And because he saw that he pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. It pleased the Jews. There are people that in their lives, the only one they want to please, they want to please their neighbors. They want to please the sinners around them. They want to please society. They want to please a particular club. They want to please a particular class. They want to please their relatives. And they leave God aside. They do not please the Lord. And if you are like that, and all your effort is, you're, you're, you're a man pleaser. You're a woman pleaser. You're a society pleaser. You're like Herod. Everything you do is to please somebody. You don't even please yourself. And you are not a man of your own mind. You are not a woman of your mind. There's no backbone. And there's no strength. And you're looking at people. Does this satisfy them? Do they smile at me? Do they approve of me? If you're pleasing people like that, your salvation will not be steady. Because anytime anybody threatens you, you just want to please them. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1 we're looking at verse 10 for for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men for if I yet please men I should not be the servant of Christ think about that Herod all that Herod wanted to do was to please men and I want to submit to you, preacher, pastor, overseer, leader, teacher in the kingdom of God, in the church of God. If your mind every time when you plea, when you preach, is to please men. And when you want to please men, if anybody is there, a sinner that needs to repent because you want to please him, you want him to feel comfortable, you want him to feel happy, you want him to love you, you want him to appreciate you, you will not talk against sin. And if you don't, if he doesn't repent of sin, he cannot be saved. But if you're going to please the Lord and you're going to please Christ, you talk against the sin so that the sinner can be saved. And in your personal Christian life, you're a Christian worker. And in your place of work where you are, your boss, this is what he wants. But it's different from what the master, master Jesus, Lord Jesus, what he wants. If you are not thinking about your salvation, about heaven, about pleasing the Lord, you just want to please your boss at all costs. And if you do that, you cannot please the Lord. You Christian, you say, I'm born again, I'm a child of God. And your mind is, people always terrify you. They frighten you. They threaten you. And if you want, you know this is the right thing to do. This is the right place to go. This is the church to worship in. And this is the doctrine to uphold. But the people around you, they're looking at you. You want to carry that uh, holy life in here. You want to carry that super life in here. You want to carry that deeper life in here. Bible, Bible, Bible. We're going to see what you're going to do. And because they're watching you, you're afraid. You'll be trembling. Your hands are already trembling. And your mouth will be quibbling as if, what am I going to do now? It is because you're a man pleaser. But once you make up your mind, I'm born again, I'm saved. And Jesus is my 
my Savior, Jesus is my Lord. The only one I want to live to please is the Lord. You'll not be like Herod, wanting to please the people and throwing away your soul into hellfire. Look at that verse again. It says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I pray you'll be the servant of Christ. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading here from verse, we're reading from verse 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. Not as pleasing men, but God. Check up your life. The people who backslide, you know why they backslide? They're afraid of men. They're afraid of women. They know the Bible. They know the word of God. They know what God requires of them. And they know that this is the way to walk, the highway of holiness. But because the people around them do not approve of what they seem to be doing, they're so afraid. And because of that fear, they want to please men. It says, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. And all the same thing you'll find about some preachers, while they are with us here, while we're all together, they can preach well. And they preach sound doctrine. Either maybe when they now go to their locations and their members are telling them, ah, you know, we don't know how God is prospering the work in the hand of the Jesus, even though he's preaching the whole truth. But if you preach that one here and you say you are standing on biblical conviction, this and that, we're telling you, here is different. Nobody is going to stay. And so if you want to talk, Good and talk smooth, smooth things to us and please us, then we'll cooperate with you and gather the people together. Because of that, they're not able to stand. But if you're a preacher and you want reward on the final day, you want to please the Lord, you don't want to do like Herod. It's unfortunate for some of the people that were in deeper life before as preachers and maybe as even overseers, state overseer, national overseer, or whatever. And something happened to them that they left deeper life. Life. Now, living deeper life is not, you know, and you know, an eternal crime. That if you still preach the word of God from cover to cover, but the, the problem is in the places they have gone, in the ministries they have established, and in the assemblies where they say they are now preaching, they cannot preach the totality of the word of God that they knew before. Why? Because their members will not allow them. And when I heard of one of those uh, preachers that led, and once uh, on Sunday, he was uh, fed up with the lives of the people in that uh, local church that he had just uh, gone to establish. And he saw the worldliness, he saw all the various things. And uh, so that day, he just felt, today I must give these people the word. And he came on that Sunday and he preached from, you know, from the Bible, holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. And when he finished one of the people came to him after the service and said we thought you left a deeper life and now what you preach this morning if you preach this next Sunday look at those people the few people that are still there all of them were telling you they were on their way so make up your mind if you want to go back to this deeper life thing well it's in your hand the following Sunday he came back and uh, so when he was going to preach he said I'm, I'm telling you a true story. He said, uh, church, um, I'm sorry. I, I heard that what I said last week offended some of you. And you thought, um, you know, going back to, you know, the thing that I was uh, believing before I, you know, came out of deeper life. But I am sorry. Uh, it's not like that at all. Everybody stay where you are. And we are together here. And whatever you want, we'll give it to you. God is great. God is good. And then they clap for him. That fellow is a backslider. 
I said that fellow is a backslider because his mind was to please people but when you preach the word of God you preach that word without fear and without favor and you know that you are responsible to the almighty God alone so that you are not a man please I come back to this uh, chapter 2 of 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 chapter 2 verse 4 but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel even so we speak not as pleasing men but God which tries our hearts for neither at any time used we flattering words as she know not if not a cloak of covetousness God is witness nor of men such we glory neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdened some as the apostles of Christ. I pray we'll be faithful to the very end in Jesus' name. And that spirit of compromise will not be upon any of us. The evil of pleasing men and not pleasing the Lord will not be upon us in Jesus' name. Are you there? Give me a good amen. amen. We come to point number two now. We come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. As we look at chapter 12, we're speaking about, about James. Now we want to talk about Peter. Let, let's look at it from verse 3. It says, and because he saw it, that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to, to take Peter also. Then verse 4, and when he had apprehended Peter, when he had arrested Peter, Peter, when he had taken him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending after Easter, that is after the Passover, to bring him forth to the people. Then it says, Peter therefore was kept in the prison. Peter therefore was kept in the prison, and but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Prayer was made for Peter. I want you to understand, no matter what man proposes or plans against you, the plan of God will prevail. No matter what your enemies or persecutors, what they propose against you, and they say, well, finish him. They cannot finish you. We will destroy him. They cannot destroy you. All those things, I believe in God. I believe the promises of God. I know that nothing will happen to me this year. We will see the end of that man, the end of that woman. No man, no woman on the face of this earth will see your end in Jesus' name. Your times are in the hands of the Lord. Your life is in the hands of the Lord. Commit yourself unto the Lord and he will bring good things to pass in all your lives in Jesus' name. As, as you understand then that your times are in the hands of the Lord. Look at this verse of scripture, Psalm 31. Psalm 31, I'm reading from verse 15. Psalm 31, reading from verse 15, my times are in thine hand. This year, this year is in the hand of the Lord for you. My times are in thine hand. You see, Peter, when Peter was arrested, all the Jews were hoping and they were thinking, uh-huh, James is gone, this one too is going to go. My times are in thine hand, deliver me from the hands of my enemies and from them that persecute me and that could have been the prayer of this Peter that my time is in the hand of the Lord and then the whole church the whole church was praying for him and, and that is uh, the evidence of fellowship that's the evidence of love it's the evidence of compassion it's the evidence of we belong to the body if one member suffers the whole body will suffer with him and they uh, don't hide yourself that's why we have house fellowship in our church House caring fellowship means when any member is uh, having problem, the rest of us in the house fellowship will know. And then we'll take time apart to pray. And those of us who just uh, came, as well as those who came to the Lord in this uh, church, in this uh, weekend revival, we need to know that you are part of a family. Don't hide yourself from us. And don't hide your problem from the rest of the people. Because as Peter was in the prison, the whole church was praying for him and God will answer our prayers. 
I said God will answer our prayers. Uh, notice five things here. Look at verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in the prison, but prayer was made. Prayer. Not politics, prayer. Not human wisdom, prayer. Not fighting, prayer. Not rioting, prayer. Not debate, prayer. Number one, when any problem happens in our lives, we understand it's not crime, it's not worry, it's not anxiety, it's not politics, it's not fighting, it's not routing. It is, what is it? Prayer. And God still answers prayer. And then he says, prayer was made, number two, without ceasing, without ceasing. They kept on praying, kept on praying, kept on praying. It appeared... Tomorrow is when Herod is going to take this man. And they didn't say, it is too late now. There's no need of praying anymore. We're going to give up. They kept on praying, importunity, perseverance, persistence in prayer. And then it says of the church, number three, it's of the church. It's not just Peter praying, but the whole church uniting together. Because where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. And if any two of you shall agree as touching anything that you ask, the Lord will answer in Jesus' name. And then number four, unto God. Unto God. Uh, the, the direction of our prayer matters a lot. It's not just that I'm praying. What are you praying about? We're praying unto God. You quote the promises of God. You know the prophecy of God. And you know the, uh, the preservation, the covenant of the Lord. And then it says, for him specific and very definite so when we pray it's a very definite thing we have an object we have a reason and we have the person we're targeting the prayer on and so number one prayer was made number two they made that prayer without ceasing number three it was the whole church doing the prayer number four they were praying unto god number five and the prayer was made for him we're looking at first thessalonians chapter five First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. That's what they did. Pray without ceasing. Anybody sick in your family, pray God will heal him. Anybody having a terrible challenge in the church, pray God will answer. And as we as a church, we bind ourselves together in faith and we're praying for such people, the Lord will answer the prayer in Jesus' name. I'm coming now to Acts chapter 12. We're looking at verse 6. Acts chapter 12, verse 6. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. When Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping was sleeping was sleeping look up here for a moment do you know the volume of tranquilizers people take in this our nation do you know the uh, the number of sleeping pills that people take in our nation because just before they sleep they read something or hear something from the news and that already disorganizes them and during that day something happened in the office they came back home and instead of knowing that my times are the hands of the Lord my destiny is not in the hand of director my destiny is not in the hand of my boss my destiny is not in the hand of any herald they cannot sleep because this happened in my office or maybe we had information they are retrenching people and they have decided that they are going to cut a 70 percent of the workforce they're going to cut everything we're already calculating maybe it will come to my turn what will happen to my children how will I pay school fees how will I pay my house and all through that night we cannot sleep and it's a pity that the same thing that bothers and worries some believers outside is also bothering and worrying the people that say they belong to God Peter slept between the two soldiers even though it was the previous it was the night the eve of the time they were going to take him and kill him but he slept there will be peace in your heart peace that passes understanding if the prince of peace is living on the inside of you you will not die prematurely and so you can sleep you'll sleep when you ought to sleep in jesus name and then let's look at isaiah chapter 26 isaiah chapter 26 i'm reading from verses 3 and 4 isaiah chapter 26 and we're reading from verses 3 and 4 it says Thou will keep him in perfect peace, 
whose might is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee, whose might is stayed on thee. You know, uh, peace of mind, that's what it is. Peace of, of what? Of mind. Peace of mind. Where you center your mind is what will give you either calmness or confusion. If you center your mind on Herod, on the threats of Herod, on the power of Herod, on the soldiers raised up by Herod. If you center your mind on the walls of the prison, and you say, this is the wall of the prison, it's so high, it's so thick, and these soldiers are chained to me. If you center your mind on the soldiers, if you center your mind on the chains, if you center your mind on the high walls, if you center your mind on Herod, you'll not have peace, you'll just be dreaming, they'll take me. And you say, it remains five hours now, it remains four and a half hours now, it remains four hours now they are coming they are coming you'll be sweating the dead of the night but if you center your mind on christ christ what did you tell me the other time when you called john and you said john follow me and you called me you asked me do you love me more than and i said yes lord i love you you asked me the second time and i said yes i love you you asked me the third time and said lord you know my heart you know i love you and then you said feed my sheep feed my lamb and then you said follow me then you told me something you said peter when you are old then people will take you to a place and it signified that he was going to get old before he died. He centered his mind on the words of Christ, on the promise of Christ. Center your mind on the promise of Christ, nothing will hurt you. It will destroy Herod before Herod has any chance to take you in Jesus' name. That's because he centers his mind on the Lord. He says that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted me. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. He'll be your strength in Jesus' name. And look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 6. Philippians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 6. Philippians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 6. Philippians 4 verse 6. It tells us be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Be worried about nothing. Because the Lord will provide. It's your Jehovah Jireh. He'll provide for you in Jesus' name. And the Lord will protect He'll preserve your life. You belong to the Lord. He'll not allow the people of the world to waste your life. Therefore, be anxious for nothing. Be worried about nothing. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, in how many things? In everything, I said in how many things? In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God. God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're coming back to Acts of the Apostle, chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, Peter was sleeping because he had peace. Peace in my soul, peace in my mind, and peace in my heart, and peace in my spirit, and peace all within me. You know, when you have peace, you're able to think straight. When you have peace, you're able to rely on the promise of God. If, you're, if your heart is turbulent, if you're afraid, if you're fearful, it will look as if you're not intelligent because the fear will seize your brain. The anxiety will kind of uh, make your brain not to function, but when there's peace in your heart, and then you sleep well, and then when you wake up in the morning, you have, you have you know you are very strong because you have slept well. And while he was sleeping, look at this verse seven. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. The angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord will protect you. And it says, and a, a light shined in the prison, and it smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, and raised him up, and raised him up. He raised you up. And then we're told, saying, arise so quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. His chains fell off from 
his hand. Anything that binds you tonight, your chains fall off from your hand. Anything that is binding your brain, your chains fall off from your brain. Anything tying your family and the chains fall off from your family. Anything that ties your business and ties your, pro, uh, your prospect and the chains fall off your prospect in Jesus' name. God is still in the business of working miracles. God is still in the business of performing wonders. And the wonders of God will not stop in your life this year in Jesus' name. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And uh, so and so he did. And he, he, and he, he, he says unto him, uh, cast, cast thy garments about thee and follow me. And he went out and he followed him. And wist not, he knew not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But he thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second watch, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city. Remember, it was a prison. And remember, it was maximum security prison. And remember, Herod was uh, calculating, well, just a few hours I get to that place because nothing can open those doors and those soldiers, they know what to do and they are going to keep that man. You know, he was uh, bragging to himself, but you know, as they came out, that door opened to them of his own accord open to them of his own accord. Uh, have, you, have you seen, you sometimes you've gone to some offices and uh, you know, you have the door there and as you come near like this without anybody touching, electronically the door is, uh, you know, arranged and then the door opens like, have you seen like that before? You know, the people who did that, they thought they are the first people to discover how a door can open by itself. Well, Peter knew that before you. I said Peter knew that before you. And we who are children of God, if they can do their scientific, electronic, and technological things, and doors open like that, my God will open your door. The Almighty will open your door. And without anybody touching, before you even get to that door like this, a door that is closed against your prosperity, a door that is closed against your miracle, a door that is closed against your prospect, as you are coming like this, the child of the king is coming, every door open. The child of the Lord is coming, every door open. And the disciples of Jesus, they are coming, every door open. They will open before you in Jesus' name. This is the year of the open door. And every door that has been locked in your life, they are opened in Jesus' name. And, and, they, and they passed through one street and, and forth, forthwith the angel departed from it. And when, verse 11, and when Peter was come to himself, he saith, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and he has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews and when he had considered the thing he came to the house of Mary the mother of John whose son name was Mark where many were gathered together praying the Lord had answered the prayer they were still praying and then you go some verse 11 and verse 13 and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate a damsel called um, came to her king named Rhoda and when she knew Peter's voice she opened not the gate for gladness look up here for a moment now many people they don't come to church often and they don't know their preacher's voice at all if the overseer is preaching do they know because they never listen. And you, those of us who are newcomers, be regular in church. You see, as Peter was knocking at the door, and Peter said, open the door. And yeah, he didn't mention his name, but Rhoda recognized the name because she had been regular in the meeting. I'd be regular in the meeting. 
you know, by the grace of God, when any of our leaders are preaching sometimes, like during this uh, Congress, I'll be, you know, sometimes sitting in the office and I'm hearing the person, I know, I said that's uh, Pastor so and so. And anyway, I've said that that's Pastor Overseer so and so. As I recognize the Bible, because I listen often, I listen often. The same thing with you. You'll be a regular member of the church in Jesus' name. And you know, sometimes uh, some people will not even recognize my voice. Can you imagine that? That here I am now, I'm preaching, and then somebody will say, today I don't think I want to go, and then he's uh, passing by that way, and the scene is coming over the microphone. It's okay. He says, uh, today they are playing, uh, they are transmitting message. And uh, the pastor is in Lagos. He doesn't know. He misses a lot in his life. I will not miss this year. I said I will not miss this year. And when I hear the voice of my pastor, the voice of my overseer, I will recognize it in Jesus' name. Amen. And the joy, the joy of that is Peter's voice. Me that will run and said, hey, God has answered our prayer. The joy that God has answered your prayer will fill your heart in Jesus' name. Amen. And this voice you are hearing now, every time you hear this voice, joy will come in your soul. Amen. Healing will come in your body. Deliverance will come unto you in Jesus' name. Now, look at this in verse, in verse 15. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him. And uh, they were astonished. You will see the result of your prayer you will see the answer of your prayer. The answer to their prayer was right there. And the answer to your prayer is uh, right there. You'll discover it in Jesus' name. Uh, look, look at the ministry of the angels. We're looking at Psalm 34, verse 7. Psalm 34, we're looking at verse 7. Psalm 34, we're reading from verse 7. This is the ministry of the angel towards you, a child of God, towards you, man of God, woman of God. This is the ministry of the angel. It tells us in a chapter 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encompass round about them that fear him and delivereth them and delivereth them. He will deliver you. He will deliver you. Psalm 91, Psalm 91. I'm reading here from verse Reading from verse 10, there shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over who? Over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear thee up in their hand, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shall thou trample under your feet. They are under your feet. Sickness under your feet. Calamity under your feet. Incurable disease under your feet. All those works of the devil, they are under your feet in Jesus' name. And so, why did God answer their prayers just like that? It to, the, it to the surprise of Herod, he answered the prayer. And to the surprise of your enemies, he will answer your prayer. Well, John, first John chapter 5, the reason God answers prayer, the reason God is answering your prayer, and even tonight, the reason why he's going to answer your prayer. In first John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14 and verse 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If we ask anything according to his will, it was the will of the Lord that Peter should come out of the prison. It was the will of the Lord that Peter's ministry should continue. It was the will of the Lord that Peter will keep on in life until he becomes old. And because that was the will of the Lord, and they were praying that Peter will not die at this time, that's why he did not die that time. Anytime we pray for the sinner's salvation, that's the will of the Lord. 
Anytime we pray for the sick to be healed, that's the will of the Lord. Anytime we pray for the oppressed to be delivered, that's the will of the Lord. Anytime we pray for the believer to be sanctified, that's the will of the Lord. And when we pray, we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know, verse 15, if we know that he heareth, he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him tonight. You have your petition in Jesus name now how, how is it that Peter was so sure that there's no trouble God is going to answer number one because of previous promise previous promise the Lord had said you're going to grow, grow, grow old and you will not die until you get old because of previous promise that's why it was certain and that's why you are starting to because of the previous promise. Number two, because of past performance. Past performance. This is not the first time that somebody will put uh, Peter in prison. He was in the prison in chapter 4. God brought him out. He was in prison in chapter 5. An angel came and brought him out and said, Go stand in the temple and declare this word of truth. Because of that past performance, that's how he knew that he was going to be delivered. Number three, because of the people's prayer. Because of the people's prayer. The whole church gathered together and they were praying. And because of previous promise, because of past performance, and because of people's uh, prayer, he was delivered. The Lord will deliver you. We come to point number three now Sinner's punishment Sinner's punishment And the prevalence of preaching Sinner's punishment And the prevalence of preaching We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12 Acts of the Apostles chapter 12 I'm reading here from verse, uh, from verse 18 Now as soon as it was day There was no small stir in, among the soldiers What was become of Peter? And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and uh, commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. We say that's surprising. How could God allow that? That these soldiers that were keeping Peter and eventually because they couldn't find Peter, then the herald determined that they will be killed. And they were killed. Uh, many people don't understand why God does what he does. Now you remember, the children of Israel, they were in Egypt. And Pharaoh said, any of you midwives, Egyptians, that see these pregnant women, Israelites, whenever they deliver a baby boy, kill that boy but we're told of two of the midwives that they will not carry out the edict of pharaoh because they feared god and the lord says the lord blessed them but you know the rest of the people that anytime they saw an israelite that was pregnant where is he where is he going to do when is she going to deliver and, and if they took that child and threw in the river that's the reason why they are first born later that's why they all died because of what they had done against the children of israel look at obadiah obadiah chapter one obadiah chapter one obadiah that's uh, near the end of the Old Testament, Obadiah, chapter 1. It has actually only one chapter, Obadiah. If you just uh, open, uh, you'll find the Obadiah is just before Jonah. Obadiah, are you there? You know Bible more than I thought. Wonderful. Obadiah, chapter 1. Let me read from verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be caught off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was one of them. Them. You see, the people of God in Jesus, they were going through turbulent time, troublous time. 
terrible time. And these people, they were rejoicing. Look at this. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother. In the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. You shouldn't have rejoiced. You see those soldiers, when they imprisoned Peter, and they said, keep this man in their heart. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, Jesus, you know how to preach. You know how to say Jesus away. They were happy that they brought a Peter into the prison. That now we have authority over this Peter. And he's chained with us. And we're keeping him. We're keeping him for death. They were rejoicing. And that's the reason why the Lord allowed judgment to come on them. Look at verse, look at uh, verse, uh, the latter part of verse 12. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity and nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the causeway to cut off those of haste that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in, in remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Because these soldiers rejoiced in the imprisonment of Peter. And they rejoiced the fact that Peter was going to die. When Peter now escaped, what they thought they wanted to happen to Peter, that is why it happened unto them. I pray that bad things will not happen to you. And when things happen to other people, you will not rejoice that bad things have happened to another person. And then when everybody is praying for Peter, say, no, I will not pray. I will not pray. Let you let it happen to him. Let you teach him a lesson. When God delivers that Peter, you'll be surprised. The bad things you are thinking should have happened to Peter will happen to such a person. I pray it will not happen to you. Let's come now to, let's come to verse 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I'm reading here. Here from verse 20. Acts chapter 12, verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with, the, with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came, they came with one accord to him. And having made Blastos the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace. And uh, be before it says, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a said day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. They flattered him. They said, This is not man talking. This is God talking. Look at verse 23. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him. Because he gave not God the glory, and he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost because of his pride. Look at Psalm 12. Psalm 12. I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 12. We're looking at verse 3. Pride is a dangerous sin. It's a, it's a deadly sin. It brings death to the people that rejoice in their prayer. Psalm 12, verses 3 and 4. The Lord shall cut off all flattering leaves and the tongues that speaketh proud things. The tongues that speaketh proud things who have said with our tongue we will prevail. Our leaves are our own. Who is Lord over us? That was the attitude of Herod. It is pride. That's why the Lord smote him. I pray God will deliver us from pride in Jesus' name. Proverbs chapter 6, chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, it shall not be unpunished. It will be punished. Though hands join in hands, such a person, because of his pride, 
will be punished. Uh, reading from Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, you see that? All the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, and that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Pride is, de is deadly, and it destroys, it kills. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 14. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 14. Notice what Jesus said. I, Luke chapter 18, verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone, underline that in your Bible, everyone, everyone, underline that, everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. Everyone in pride, exalting himself, shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself, tell me, shall be exalted. We'll come back to finish up now. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. And we're now reading verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12. We're looking at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, Acts 12, 24. And the word of God grew and multiplied. And the word of God grew and multiplied. What does that mean? When it says the word of God grew and multiplied. Well, to start with, that's what Herod wanted to destroy. That's what Herod wanted to stop. He didn't want the word to be going on in the hearts of people. And people believing the word of God. But after Herod died, all the things that stand in your world were die off. All the things that stand in the way of the calling of God for your life. The Lord will take everything away in Jesus' name. And the word of the Lord will grow. And the word of the Lord will multiply. What does that mean? Number one, the preaching of the word grew and multiplied. That's what it means that people were preaching everywhere now. And the preaching of the word, they grew and they multiplied. Number two, the people of the word. The people that say the word is my map. The word is my roadmap, And the word is my guide. And I'm going to lay by the word of the Lord. They were increasing as people were being born again. These people were increasing. The people of the word grew and multiplied. Number three, the practice of the word grew and multiplied. The people that were living by the word, that were practicing the word, and they say, I'm a man of the word. I'm a man of the Bible. Everything I do, I gauge by the word. Everything I do, I examine by the word, the practice of the word grew and multiplied. Number four, the power of the word grew and multiplied. You see, as those people were receiving the word of the Lord and then the power, transforming power of the word in their lives, the word that saves and the word that sanctifies, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. That power of the word grew and multiplied the places of preaching the word multiplied and grew. What they had just, you know, here and there and there before, it was only Jerusalem, it went to Judea, it went to Samaria, it went to Caesarea, it went everywhere. The places of the preaching of the word grew and multiplied. The prominence of the word grew and multiplied in, in their fellowships everywhere they went. You know, the word became prominent as you entered into those uh, places of worship. The prominence of the word grew and multiplied. The prevalence of the word grew and multiplied. The word of God came and just, just uh, buried every other thing. That the word prevailed everywhere and the word was number one. The word was present, preeminent, and prominent. That's what it means when it says the word of God grew and multiplied. Look at it from this other direction. The word grew. The worshippers grew. 
the people that worshipped on the basis of the word. The word of God calling them to worship. And they were worshipping God in spirit and in truth. But all those people, the true worshippers, they grew and multiplied. The witnesses, ye shall be witnesses unto me. They took that word serious. Everywhere they went, they were telling people and witnessing. And everybody, now the converts were talking about it. The old timers were talking about it. And the disciples were talking about that. The witnesses grew and they multiplied. The warriors, those who took the sword of the spirit. And they said, well, this word will bring down every enemy. We've seen Herod already. He is gone. Every other enemy against the word, the sword of the spirit. We're going to wield it everywhere. Those warriors grew and multiplied. Their willingness to obey grew and multiplied. They said, this God answers prayer. Look at what he did. He sent his angel. He, de he delivered Peter. Look at what he did. This Herod that was bragging, he was going to finish the church. Before he could finish the church, God finished him. They said, now I'm settled. Now I'm happy. I'm going to willingly obey the word of God. The washing of water by the word. The washing of water by the word. Everything grew and multiplied, and the wonders grew and multiplied. Everywhere they had the word, wonders were taking place. Everywhere they preached the word, wonders were taking place. That's what it means when it says, and the word grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. When they had fulfilled their ministry. When they had fulfilled their ministry. I will fulfill my ministry. You'll fulfill your ministry. I want you to go back home with one word, fulfillment. Go back with one word, fulfillment. Every promise of God will be fulfilled in your life. The project and plan of God will be fulfilled in your life. And you will not leave that place until you have fulfilled your ministry in Jesus' name. Your life will be fulfilled. Your family will be fulfilled. The work of your hand will be fulfilled. Everything you set your hand on, like Barnabas and Saul fulfilled their ministry, you'll fulfill yours in Jesus' name. This year for you will be a year of fulfillment. The year of the world. And the year of wonders in your life in Jesus' name. From tonight, those wonders will begin. Why don't you rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer? See what we have learned. Meditate on the word that we have learned. And know that Herod does not have the final say in your life. And enemies do not have the final say in your life. There is a God in heaven who answers prayer. And there is power in the Lord. And the power of the Lord will roll away all those problems you have in Jesus' name. Look up to the Lord. There is the year of fulfillment. The year of fulfillment. The year of fulfillment. The year of fulfillment for you. You talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. It's a year of fulfillment. I thank you, Lord. It's a year of fulfillment. Talk to the Lord in prayer. I understand whatever happened to James, God understands. Whatever happened to James, God understands. You are not James. Your, your time is still there. And the plan of God is still for you. And the Lord is still going to fulfill his will in your life. You can rejoice. You can relax. You can rest. You can rest in the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I know. Yes, Lord, I know that the Lord is going to fulfill all his plans plan, all his purpose, all his promise, and he's going to fulfill with his power in my life. He will do it. He will do it. There's no anxiety. There's no room for anxiety. There's no room for worry. There's no room for sleeplessness. Because if you depend upon the promise of God, the peace of God is there. The peace that passes understanding will keep your soul and will keep your mind. The peace that is deep like a river will keep your soul, will keep your mind. He that rests his mind on the Lord. You rest your mind on the Lord. You rest your mind in the Lord. And because you are resting your mind in the Lord, great will be your peace. Great will be your peace. No more anxiety. No more anxiety. You rest in hope. You rest in faith. You know that the Lord is on your side. The power of the Lord is on your side. No evil will come upon you. No calamity will come upon you. The promises of God are yes and amen. And like Peter rested, like Peter slept, so you will rest and so you will sleep at the right time. Doctor's report will not frighten you. 
enemies will not frighten you sickness will not frighten you calamity will not frighten you pain will not frighten you and the threat of herod the threat of herod the threat of herod the threat of enemies will not frighten you the actions of those schemers of those corners of those coffers will not threaten you your life is safe and your life is secured in the hands of the lord and as we pray you remember the church continued to pray peter was kept in prison and prayer was made prayer was made without ceasing unto god for him without ceasing don't stop without ceasing don't stop without ceasing prayer was made of the church for him and god answered god is answering your prayer and god answered god is answering your prayer and god answered god is answering your prayer and god answered if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us if we ask anything 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 according to his will he heareth us you know he hears you you know your prayers are answered and so god sent an angel from heaven God sent an angel from heaven. The angels are still there. The angels are still there. They minister to the heirs of salvation. They minister to the heirs of salvation. Those angels, they do minister. They do minister. And your angels do behold the face of her father who is in heaven. They said, they said it's Peter's angel. They knew that an angel beside Peter, always watching, always watching, always taking care. You have an angel too. You have an angel too. He lifts you up. He will not allow you to dash your feet against the stone. Because he watches over you. God watches over you. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. Because God is on your side. God is on your side. He will see you through. And the angel tapped him. And then he rose up. He, bought, he put on his sandals, he put on his garment, and as they were going, all those iron doors open. This year is a year of open door. This year is a year of open door. This year is a year of open door. Doors are opening before you. Doors of opportunity, doors of prosperity, doors of purity, and doors of holiness, and doors of uh, progress, and doors of success, doors of victory opening before you. No herald will put you behind the bar. No herald will put you in confinement. Doors are opening. Doors are opening. Doors are opening. No calamity this year. The doors are opening already. And eventually, all the soldiers that rejoiced at the incarceration of Peter, they lost their joy. They lost their lives. They thought Peter will die. What they thought, the negative thing they thought about Peter, that's what happened to them. Herod himself, Herod himself, before the end of the chapter, he was gone. He was gone. And uh, those uh, things against your life, before the end of the year, they are gone. And then the word grew and multiplied. The power of the word grew and multiplied. The preaching of the word grew and multiplied. The practice of the word grew and multiplied. The people of the word grew and multiplied. The performance of the word grew and multiplied. The places of preaching the word grew and multiplied. The prominence of the world in your life, in your family, growing and multiplying. The prevalence of the world growing and multiplying in your life. Let the world grow. Let the world grow in your life. Let the worship grow in your life. Let the witnessing grow in your life. Let the willingness grow in your life. Let the wonders grow in your life. This is the year, the year of the world, the year of wonders. The year of the world, the year of wonders. The year of the world, the year of wonders. 
Remember the central word in your life this year? Fulfillment. 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 Barnabas and Saul fulfilled their ministry. The year of fulfillment has come for you. The year of fulfillment has come for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And the fulfilled children of God said, The unconquerable children of God said, This year is your year. The year of your victory. The year of your power. And the year of wonders in your life in Jesus' name. This year, no worry, no anxiety. Wonder, signs, and power in your life. And already this January, the Lord has started what he has started this January. He will continue your life in Jesus' name. You drop all the sicknesses behind. Calamity, drop it behind. Herod, drop him behind. All those soldiers that feel that they're looking for your death, forget about them. You will have the victory. Where are the victorious people there? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this Bible study. This Bible study is meant for every brother here. It's meant for every sister here. The victory in your word, give unto them in Jesus' name. All the plans of Herod against anyone here, all the plans of Haman against anyone here, all the plans of Nebuchadnezzar against anybody here, all the plans of the devil against anyone here, we cancel it. Lord, there's no anxiety anymore. There's no worry anymore. We're going into this year with confidence, with faith, with trust, and with peace of mind in Jesus' name. Nothing coming from Herod will terrify any of us. Nothing coming from the enemy will terrify any of us. I pray, Lord, every negative thing you break away from the life of every child of God here in Jesus' name. All your chains fall down in Jesus' name. All the fetters fall away from your life in Jesus' name. Bad luck. Calamity, yoke, evil, any curse, come out in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray this year will be a year of peace, a year of prosperity, a year of protection, a year of preservation, a year of the prevalence of the word in Jesus' name. I pray that your people, as they go back home, they go back home in victory. They go back home in joy. They go back home with answers to their prayers. Divine intervention after disciples' intercession. I pray that all the prayers who are prayed today and this weekend will be yes and amen on your life in Jesus' name. You can now go with joy with victory, with healing, with deliverance, and with prosperity for the rest of this year in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you because I know it is done. It's confirmed in every life in Jesus' name. 